Good morning, everyone. So welcome again to our weekly Paase webinar. So this is the 24th lecture for this year. And we're talking about how to monitor fish diversity using artificial intelligence. Our speaker for today is a professor at the Department of Computer Science of the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and laboratory head of the Computer Vision and Machine Intelligence Group of the same department. He received his undergraduate and graduate degrees in electrical engineering from the University of the Philippines, Diliman, as well as a graduate degree in computer science at the Kyoto University, Japan. He did his postdoctoral studies at University Libre de, Bru de Brussels, Belgium on swarm robotics, and his current research interests revolve around applications of deep learning, probabilistic machine learning, and decision making, swarm ro robot robotics, and computation to problems in environment, healthcare, and education. So without further ado, um, let's all welcome our speaker for today, Professor Pros Naval. Ross, are you ready? Yes, uh, okay. Gay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gay, for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, how we could use uh, artificial intelligence to uh, monitor uh, fish uh, biodiversity in our oceans. <clears throat> so let me first uh, start of this uh, seminar by uh, asking this uh, question, uh, what is uh, biodiversity? So biodiversity is the variety of uh, uh, life forms, variety and variability of life forms from terrestrial, marine, and aquatic ecosystems. So for marine ecosystems, this variety shows itself in the wide differences between species and even within species, as well as the abundance of these species in the world's oceans and seas. Marine biodiversity is important for us for several reasons. Uh, the ocean itself is not only a source of, source of food for us, it can also provide us medicine that can cure diseases like uh, well, cancer uh, and, and many others. In fact, uh, in our Marine Science Institute, um, there have been lots of researches along this line of using, um, so for example, cone snail uh, to uh, as painkiller. So cone snail, rather, cone snail toxin, so called conotoxins, which have been proven um, well useful in treating Parkinson's uh, disease, uh, uh, strokes, epilepsy, and so on. So <clears throat> uh, just an example, there are about uh, 33,000 known fish species and uh, 2,500 known coral species in our uh, oceans, you know, so in the world's oceans. So the figure, the actual figures are actually many times more. <clears throat> so the coral triangle region has long been recognized as the global center of marine biodiversity. The variety of uh, species decreases uh, westwards <clears throat> towards the Indian Ocean and uh, also eastwards towards most of the Pacific. Now within this uh, triangle, we can find the most bio, the most diverse fish and uh, coral species in the entire planet. Now within this uh, coral triangle, the Philippines holds the distinction of having the most number of fish uh, species per unit area. So our country sits right at the center of the coral triangle. We are at the heart of the world's most diverse marine ecosystem. 
for fish and other marine organisms, high biodiversity in populations, in their populations, confers protection against um, climate change, pollution, and other environmental and man-made stressors. Now just to um, illustrate how diverse our marine ecosystem is, our Philippine marine ecosystem is, uh, a group of scientists from the uh, California Academy of Sciences conducted an expedition not so many years ago. And in one year, in just one year of their expedition, they discovered more than 100 new marine species. And that's, that's a lot. No? It's like one every three days um, <clears throat> of uh, a new, you know, discovering new species. Now, unfortunately, unfortunately, there are threats and there are numerous threats to biodiversity because of our human tendency to overexploit nature. For example, overfishing, dynamite fishing, human carelessness, they all endanger marine sustainability, which affect not only the balance of life in our ocean, but also the social and economic well-being of communities that depend on the sea for their livelihood. Now our government has taken numerous steps to counteract these threats. There are several laws that uh, regulate uh, fishing and mandate sustainable management of our marine resources. So we have MPAs or marine protected areas these, these are no fishing zones where fish can breed and spill over to the surrounding areas. Now, once an MPA has been established, it is crucial to continuously monitor and evaluate the area to assess the effectiveness of this uh, uh, marine protected area. Just a uh, well, case study was done in, uh, uh, in 1974 in uh, Subilon Island. This is the so-called uh, Subilon Island Marine Sanctuary. This is the first municipal marine sanctuary mm -hmm. in the country. So in 1974, all fishing uh, was stopped on a portion of the Subilon Island island reef so for 10 years and uh, uh, during a span of 10 years the living coral cover and fish abundance actually more than doubled so the marine scientists uh, actually measured uh, the um, yearly catch outside the sanctuary so this is not within the sanctuary but outside the sanctuary so the catch uh, more than doubled from 14 metric tons per square kilometer to 36 metric tons per square kilometer. So this is an example of how important these uh, marine protected areas are. You know? So this, uh, the spillover effect is actually, uh, is actually accepted um, by uh, scientists nowadays. So. <clears throat> It really does help in uh, increasing the, the fish even outside the sanctuary. Um, <clears throat> so, so how did the scientists get all these numbers? They actually conduct marine health monitoring. So the monitoring of a marine protected area is done through what is called a fish uh, visual census. And this is done to determine the success of marine conservation and uh, rehabilitation initiatives. So this census is done by a fish expert 
by fish experts swimming along a transect with the aid of a scuba gear. So the, the experts counts uh, uh, the fish within an area and estimates the fish sizes and identifies the different species as well. So, so they need uh, this information to be able to compute for the biomass in metric tons per square kilometers, among, in, uh, among many other uh, fish parameters. So, um, so as I've said earlier, the government has done something to establish uh, MPAs. And this uh, MPAs uh, actually monitored. In fact, the NIPAS Act requires the DNR to submit an annual report to the president of the country and to Congress on the status of protected areas uh, in the country. However, this is not done regularly due to lack of expertise. When we say lack of expertise, there, there are uh, many experts. There are many uh, marine scientists who can do Fish visual census, but it's not enough. The number is not enough because there are actually uh, 1,800 um, marine protected areas that need to be monitored every year. So marine scientists uh, look for species like, like all these uh, nice looking fishes and many others, of course. Uh, so these are the so-called indicator species. Uh, they call so because they actually indicate coral resilience. So when a when you see all these nice fishes in a marine ecosystem, that means that um, the coral, the coral, uh, the ecosystem is uh, doing well. And um, we're also interested in monitoring, counting the target uh, fish uh, species for, for uh, commercial reasons. So these are the fishes that are sold in the market uh, for food. Now, <clears throat> the manual method of conducting fish visual census suffers from uh, biases no? uh, and limitations you know, that uh, tend to overestimate or underestimate refish uh, assessments. No? Uh, for example, uh, when a diver is present in an area, obviously the fish, uh, they actually get ag agitated or they swim away. So that somehow, by the very presence of uh, the diver, uh, the counts are already skewed in number. In number, no? so the uh, the fishes either some species uh, are attracted to the diver, so the count is uh, increased for that species, while many others actually uh, the number goes down because they are obviously afraid of, uh, of the diver uh, generating bubbles, uh, especially. And there's also that limitation of uh, diver fatigue and diver skill in actually accurately counting and identifying fish. So remember that the fishes are all uh, moving and it's hard to, uh, to actually count uh, the, the fish Per, per per unit volume. So a, a fish expert would imagine a, a, a unit volume or more concretely a five by five by five meter unit volume um, in front of him or in front of her. And uh, all the fishes that are inside that uh, volume that five by five by five volt uh, unit volume or equivalently five by five area. 
will be uh, counted. Those that are outside that would, would not be included in the count. So that itself is already uh, challenging. It already requires a very high level of expertise. So um, uh, on above the surface of water, five meters, five, five by five is uh, easier to imagine, but underwater, everything is uh, closer by 30%. So, so that actually requires a lot of uh, practice. And then there's also a limited or no visual record of the actual census. So the divers uh, DC um, writing, writing the values on the species, the names of the different species on, on the slate. Um, and, uh, also, and also remember that uh, there are many species. Now there are, uh, in the Philippines, there are close to 3,000 species of, uh, of fish. And therefore the fish expert must uh, memorize all these uh, names. The names are all in, you know, in, in Greek and, and Latin. And uh, not only they have, do they have to remember the names, they also have to identify on site the uh, species of a, a particular fish. So, so, so that's uh, very challenging and that requires very high level of expertise. Um, and uh, the, the fish expert must uh, count uh, very fast. And then also there's the, the limitation of um, uh, having to stay underwater you know, for, for a limited uh, time. So uh, you cannot conduct surveys for extended periods of time uh, for obvious reasons. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, so that's uh, so. Th th these are the challenges uh, that uh, uh, a fish expert would uh, actually encounter. And so, uh, having to stay underwater for a limited period of time, counting uh, moving fishes, uh, uh, while of course, uh, uh, you know, monitoring all all the instruments uh, for uh, for safety. Now, so, so the conventional protocol for measuring these uh, environmental uh, indicators actually involves two fish, uh, two scuba divers or fish experts who can identify on site any of the thousands of uh, species of fish uh, in order to do a fish survey. So as you know, prolonged stay underwater gives rise to uh, human fatigue, and uh, it also compromises uh, uh, safety. Furthermore, there are not so many um, fish experts, at least uh, it's not enough. No? So the number is not enough for all these fish experts to do the monitoring of uh, the 1,800 marine protected areas in, in the country. So that's the problem that we uh, have right now. There are very few fish experts. And there's what we call the data collection bottleneck. To collect the data, you need uh, these experts who also will analyze the data. What we are proposing is uh, a semi-automated uh, fish uh, visual census, uh, which we have actually uh, well called the fish eye. No? So for for the, this semi-automated fish visual census, you don't need a high level of expertise. Any regular licensed uh, open water diver, and there are thousands of them in the country, can actually do a fish eye semi-automated uh, fish visual census. So, so anyone, even without any knowledge of fish, as long as uh, uh, the diver is able to follow instructions, um, the, 
uh, the census can be done. So this is uh, something that's very scalable. Uh, you don't need to depend on experts. Well, you don't need to depend on experts to collect the data. So the experts are probably uh, better off, uh, you know, analyzing data and giving uh, advice to uh, to uh, communities on uh, what to do. So again, Fish Eye is a semi-automated uh, fish visual census protocol that allows any scuba diver, any licensed scuba diver without any specialized knowledge of fish to conduct a fish uh, survey in a short period of time. So again, it is possible and it, and it is feasible to conduct fish uh, surveys in all the 1,800 sites, 1,800 marine protected areas in the country. Uh, this, uh, what we are proposing is a do it yourself, so to speak, you know, fish uh, census. So, um, since uh, practically anyone can do it, any regular diver can do it. So, uh, fish eyes is uh, named so because we combine uh, fish and AI. So, it's, uh, yeah, uh, it's fish eye, it's, uh, that's the origin of the name, um, fish plus AI. And AI here um, uses at the moment uh, deep learning. Um, <clears throat> So the feature, the main features of fish eyes that uh, there's uh, the accuracy in collecting the data. And then uh, the image analysis uh, is uh, powered by artificial intelligence. And the information that is collected is stored in the cloud for later uh, analysis. So it's going to be there for years. So it won't, um, it won't get lost because it's stored in the cloud. The information about a particular site uh, is uh, stored in the cloud. Now, um, so I'd like to emphasize again that uh, uh, there's no specialized uh, knowledge of fish needed in order to do a high quality survey. So this is a picture of uh, uh, my student. Uh, uh, She's actually, at the time, a, a, an MS, Master's in Computer Science student with uh, prac practically no knowledge of uh, fish uh, taxonomy. Um, and of course, myself, well, we're, both of us know nothing about fish uh, taxonomy. And we are conducting a fish uh, survey. We are here uh, calibrating our, at that time, makeshift camera rig uh, in preparation for taking vi uh, fish videos along a, a transect line. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so fish eye can do the following measurements. Can identify, first of all, the species of the different uh, Fishes seen by the cameras, it can count the fishes, and it can also measure the size and length, well, size of the fish, of the individual fishes, as well as the biomass of the fish, meaning how many grams the fishes weigh. And uh, also, I can measure the density of fish in an area. Um, so all this site specific information will be stored in a cloud for monitoring and assessment uh, purposes. Um, now, I'm supposed to talk about uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, let's, let's talk about it a little bit. Uh, uh, so in recent years, 
a branch of uh, AI called machine learning and more specifically deep learning have made great or giant strides you know, than um, well far larger than initially imagined. So uh, what is deep learning? Deep learning is a family of algorithms that mimic the human brain. So deep learning algorithms are an improvement over their early and uh, shallower versions called artificial neural networks. So uh, deep learning is basically uh, neural networks 2.0. So uh, we have lots of neurons, uh, thousands of neurons. Um, and these algorithms are capable of learning from data, in this case, from fish, visual data, uh, and uh, well, produce uh, programs that are beginning to rival humans in their ability to recognize pictures, uh, translate from one language to another, and many other tasks. So that's uh, deep learning. Um, now, this uh, is uh, the deep learning um, component or components of fish eye. So you have actually several uh, deep learning modules here. Um, Okay, I won't, I won't talk about this much uh, because it's uh, actually a bit uh, complicated to explain. Um, so suffice it to say that uh, uh, Fisher actually uses deep learning in many of its uh, modules and you continually to improve uh, the technology using the latest uh, uh, deep learning uh, algorithms. So fish eye can recognize a species of fish. Uh, at the moment, it can recognize 517 species out of uh, the 3,000 species of fish uh, found in the Philippines. And you might ask, uh, why only 517? What about the uh, remaining uh, you know, 2,500 more. Uh, can you identify this uh, species as well? Well, the answer is uh, we actually need training data uh, to um, accurately classify uh, fish uh, uh, species, to identify them properly. But there are ma many of the uh, fish uh, species are not usually seen so we have not visited enough uh, sites, although we have visited more than 50 sites in the country. Um, we need more data to be able to classify the remaining 2,500 species. However, it's just a matter of time before we can actually do it, since the algorithm actually learns from whatever data uh, is uh, ingested by the algorithm. So our algorithms are actually robust against uh, illumination changes. Um, <clears throat> uh, we didn't realize that uh, it's really very difficult to process underwater images. Uh, we thought that, uh, okay, what works on the surface above the, above the water will actually work underwater. And we were mistaken and we spent a lot of time and effort developing our own algorithms, modifying those uh, um, deep learning modules that are available out there uh, for our for our problem for for fish identification. So uh, fish videos are very challenging because there are big illumination changes underwater uh, happening within one second, you know, sub-second. So there's what you call lensing effect, especially at shallower depths, so at uh, depths of about five meters. 
So there's lensing in this uh, lensing effect, and this lensing effect actually confuses uh, traditional machine learning algorithms. But we've been able to solve this problem already for fish eye. Now, uh, our algorithms are also robust against uh, spectral absorption effects. So what is this uh, effect? As we know, uh, light with longer wavelengths are strongly absorbed by ocean water. So the colors of the rainbow, starting with uh, red, followed by orange, then yellow and so on, they start to disappear with uh, increasing depth. So this basically means that uh, what appears, say, yellowish uh, at greater depths will no longer appear yellow. And uh, this is very challenging because, as we know, to identify fish, you depend on color a lot. So your algorithm has to take into account as well this uh, spectral absorption effect. So our uh, fish eye technology basically consists of a data capture device. So it's a rig with uh, um, four sets of stereo cameras looking at the four different directions, north, south, east, west, or well, you can change the orientation of course, but you can image forward, backward, to the right and to the left all at once, simultaneously. And you need stereo cameras uh, to be able to, to uh, measure the, the sizes of fishes. So we have a fish eye data analyzer, uh, uh, which actually processes, ingests the data and uh, uh, produces the following results. So the fish ID, fish count, fish size, and, and other information as well. So fish eye is safer, is faster and cheaper and highly scalable. And with this, so uh, we can actually do more uh, frequent uh, uh, census. Now here's a uh, fish eye in action. So it's uh, the software is identifying the different uh, species of fish, as well as uh, measuring their sizes and the uh, masses. So the software also knows the distance, the coordinates, the actual coordinates of the different uh, uh, fishes, uh, which is important for us to, um, which is important for calculating the, the fish density. So here we have the total biomass uh, seen so far. So, um, <clears throat> um, yeah, this is a big number, it's uh, unusual. So far, it has seen 11 species. Um, and uh, among them, there are five uh, indicator species, which basically tells us that this uh, area here is, uh, is uh, good, um, is biodiverse and uh, is, 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 is uh, resilient. No? So, so these are the information that uh, you will see. Um, so the the fish eye can identify the species, the length, uh, you know, weight, and measure the density. And then we have here also the metadata, uh, where it was taken, temperature, depth, and so on. And so on. all this uh, information will be stored in the cloud. So this is your 
cloud-based information system. Um, so the, the fish videos and process information are geotagged uh, and uh, uh, they are all stored there for, for researchers and um, uh, marine protected area administrators to analyze later on. So they can do comparisons between sites. They can do comparisons um, um, and analyze time series uh, data. So, okay, so for example, uh, well, we have here a plot of the, uh, okay, uh, two sites, no? inside an MPA and outside the MPA. So you can see that uh, there's of course a difference and uh, you can measure the difference. Um, <clears throat> and this is uh, okay at, at this particular, on this particular date. So all this information are actually uh, stored there for later analysis. There's also a permanent visual record in the, in the cloud. So this information is stored there. And this is, you, you know that uh, this is how the coral reef uh, looked like um, four years ago. So uh, if there's an increase in the number of fishes, that can be the, uh, documented. And, and all this uh, actually uh, avail available for everyone, for, for all those who have access to, to see. So 10 years from now, you still uh, could, should be able to access this uh, information. Then um, uh, th it's the software system can actually assist uh, decision makers in uh, answering questions like, uh, uh, is it time to fish at this particular time? So, so if your data, for example, is the following, then uh, it tells you a lot. So, so on the board vertical are the different um, fish types uh, obtained from a biodiversity survey and the uh, horizontal axis is the percentage of the maximum fish length for the different fish uh, classes. So this uh, graph here shows us that most of the fishes are not yet mature. So the jacks are just 62% of their maximum length on average. So all this uh, information um, are crucial for, for uh, well, informing LGUs on whether to fish or not fish at, a, at this particular time, for example. So it's not advisable to fish because uh, if you catch the fishes, then you'd probably be catching the juveniles and uh, you won't have um, potential parents for the next generation of uh, fish for that particular fish group. You can also compare the number of fishes uh, over time at the particular site. So is it really increasing, decreasing? And this will tell us how effective the marine protected area um, initiative or rehabilitation effort is, uh, is doing. So you also can measure the tons, number of tons of fish per square kilometers, the biomass broken down according to Indicator biomass, target biomass. We have uh, tested the uh, fish eye in more than 50 sites in the country, including Tubataha. So in Tubataha alone, we have data for, for 14 sites within Tubataha. Uh, and uh, we've had a trial surveys in Hawaii, a care of our uh, collaborator from University of Hawaii. Uh, so when do we use or when can we use a fish eye? 
So these are the use cases, uh, comparison of uh, marine protected area versus non-marine marine protected areas, inside or outside, or inside versus outside MPAs. Then you can also use uh, the technology for doing baseline studies for EIA, environmental impact assessment of industrial plants, for example, and others as well for assessment of uh, post-disaster recovery. So like fish ground, uh, ship grounding rather than ship grounding, oil spills. So uh, obviously these, uh, uh, these uh, will change the number of species, the, the counts and so on. So, but uh, how do you objectively assess whether the area has fully recovered or partially recovered from an oil spill or from a ship grounding accident. You can also use this for valuation of fisheries and marine resources, assessment of fisheries of uh, mangroves and for doing a fish inventory for ecotourism purposes. Um, so fish eye is, uh, is actually developed by myself uh, and Dr. Dr. Laura David of the Marine Science Institute. So we work together in um, in uh, conceptualizing fish eye, and uh, actually we now have a spin-off, a university spin-off uh, called Fish Eye Analytics. So if you're interested in having a survey. We can do it for you. We can train you how to conduct a, a fish a visual survey in your community. So, uh, of course, uh, there are many other researchers involved um, in our um, in our fish eye project, uh, which was actually funded by the USD, uh, Fishered, and uh, USD Tapi. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for that, Prost. It was a very interesting presentation. And um, yeah, so I'd like to invite our audience to please uh, type any questions or comments that you, may you might have uh, for the presentation. Okay so, we, okay, so we have a first question from Vic Ilag. So it's very impressive. Have you considered using fish eye for tuna ranching? For tuna ranching, ranch. um, I think uh, yeah, um, fish eyes uh, was primarily developed for reef fish, but it can actually handle tuna with a little bit of modification. Uh, the uh, our, the way we capture fish images is that we have a we have a camera rig that is uh, placed on the seafloor, however. For tuna, since it's uh, constantly moving around and it's not, uh, you know, it's not near the, um, the sea floor, we can have an ROV. In fact, we have an ROV. We have ROVs actually in, uh, collecting data. Um, unfortunately, during this pandemic, uh, we've not been able to go out to further make uh, tests. But yeah, uh, an ROV is. Uh, a data capture, one possible data capture um, modality. Yeah, um, we are ready for that. Yeah, so the answer is yes, we can do that for, uh, for tuna ranching. Okay, sorry, just to um, maybe just add on to that question. So uh, if, if it will be used eventually for tuna ranching, so what kind of modifications uh, should be done um, in the current uh, yeah, in the current uh, model that you have. Oh, as far as the software is concerned, there's little, there's hardly any modification that uh, we need to process tuna data. In fact, it's easier because you're going to deal only with just a few species of tuna. Um, so as long as the, the ROV can ROV cameras can capture the images 
uh, we can actually measure the sizes of the tuna and therefore since we know the size we can measure the we can approximately measure the the weight of each one of them then i think it's going to be very useful for for uh, commercial purposes so you know uh, is it time to harvest this tuna or not uh, and that sort of thing can be a uh, answered uh, using fish eye i think Okay, great. Uh, there was a follow-up from uh, Vic. So he's asking if you haven't been approached by tuna ranchers yet. Um, actually, yes, we've been approached. Uh, uh, yeah, we've been approached, uh, but you know, uh, they probably wouldn't want us to disclose uh, who they are at the moment. Uh, yeah, we've been approached. So it's an is it an ongoing uh, negotiation? <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> All right. Okay, I'll take one question first from the YouTube channel. Um, it comes from Angeline Dow. So congratulations, Pros. Um, is there a, something like a fish eye citizen that involves normal citizens to monitor on and protect marine biodiversity, like making it live and allow the citizens to do the tagging? Oh, yeah, that's an interesting concept. Um, it can be done by by you know they they could be the fish eye could be um, a, the the collection the data collection could be citizen science here uh, so any ordinary citizen with you know the right uh, equipment can actually conduct a survey yes it's possible it's possible to organize a group uh, doing that um, regularly and it's an interesting idea so. Yes, very possible, and uh, of course that requires a, lit a little bit more organization. Yeah, there's no there's no obstacle for for doing that. Yeah, yeah that that is quite interesting, and I suppose you'll be able to gather more data if right. a lot of people will be empowered to actually do the ta the tagging. Yes, and they own the data. So uh, the nice thing about fish is that uh, you get the data, you own the data. Uh, we'll give you back the results and we will not share the results with anyone without your permission. So it's yours. Uh, yeah, it's like, you know, some kind of data privacy act for fishes also. You know. Oh, okay. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, so the next one comes from Roland Hieronimo. So he's been following your work and they're very promising. Can the fish eye be used also for identifying fish out of water? For example, caught fish in landing centers or market. It could be particularly useful for LGUs and even private individuals to help them with fish catch monitoring, even if they don't have the same expertise of NGAs like BIFAR or NFRDI. Yes, um, we have actually some. We have we have the software already. In fact, uh, this was done uh, three years ago. Uh, I, you can use an ordinary cell phone to capture fish. You know the the species, so the the fishes um, that are being sold, and identify them, and even measure the the size of the species. So we, we, we have a project like that. This was done by uh, some undergraduate students. Um, yeah, and also uh, we, the, we are having talks with a company outside the country, in New Zealand particularly. Uh, and their interest is to, to actually look at, you know, let the fish eye analyze the, the catch from cameras mounted on the ship, so the fish, fishing boats. So that's the that's the project. Uh, yeah, uh, can definitely identify fish, uh, fish and measure their sizes above uh, above water. It's easier. In fact, it's easier. So, yeah. Okay, thank you for that. The next one comes from Edsel Peña. So great talk. In terms of uncertainty quantification regarding the inference that you could make, for example, if you are estimating the number of a certain type of fish or the mean or median, how do you perform this from the data obtained through fish eye? Um, we, we, of course, we calibrate the cameras. Um, we've made tests on the accuracy of the length of the fish size calculation. 
Um, at a distance of one meter, meaning the object or the fish is one meter away from the camera, um, and this is underwater, the accuracy could be as high as one millimeter. And I myself was very surprised at this. Now imagine, uh, uh, you know, uh, measuring the size of an object down to millimeter millimeter level. Uh, of course, you have to take into account the fact that the fish is moving, and when we have when you have a moving of object, there's what you call image blur. So now you don't know where is the exact boundary of the fish. You know? So, but then. Um, for marine scientists, uh, plus minus 10% is already acceptable. So, um, yeah, so that's uh, now this regarding the length of the fish and therefore the biomass. Uh, regarding, regarding the accuracy of uh, fish identification, for we're hitting 97% accuracy uh, of fish identification okay. so yeah okay good thanks thanks for that uh, so just another comment from roland so together with an ai fish id system and a model for converting volume to weight this could be a powerful tool for lg use to monitor how much fish and what types they are actually getting so it can also be useful in identifying rare and new species from market Okay. And then um, Giselle has a question. So major fisheries in the country, like sardines, milkfish, shrimp, shrimps, prawns, and any aquaculture applications. Have you, um, have you used this for, for such aquaculture applications? Um, so at the moment, it's uh, the software is specialized for fish. You no, know, for, for shrimp, uh, we need to to modify it a little bit to process the shrimp data. Um, for aquaculture, yeah, as long as it's fish, uh, we are okay, I think. Um, so in fact, we're having talks with some uh, companies uh, who are interested in using fish eye for monitoring or for actually determining the correlation between uh, their feeds, uh, the amount of feeds that they um, give to the fishes and the size. You know? So uh, are they, are they uh, spending a lot for feeds that are not really taken by the fish? That, that sort of question can, can, be, can be answered, uh, not really directly, but you know, that, could provide useful information for, for uh, uh, you know, to be able to answer that um, question properly. Okay, thank you. Um, so another one from Vic Ilag. So he noted that the patent has been filed. So when was this filed and what is the current status and in what jurisdictions? Okay, so the patent, we filed the patent in December of uh, 2016. Filed uh, patents uh, in other countries. Uh, in the U.S., uh, we filed it uh, last year, I think. Yeah. So, uh, and in uh, in Brazil, uh, Mexico, Indonesia. So these are the countries where we filed our uh, we filed patents. Um, we're still waiting for for uh, the results actually. Okay, thank you for that, Ross. I have a question. So at the moment, the device, like how deep can, can you use it like at the moment? Um, depth really is not a limitation for the device itself because it is just a, an ordinary, well, it's, it's, a, it's a camera rig plus mm -hmm. uh, GoPro, GoPro cameras. Um, we can replace the cameras with the Sony cameras if you wish. Uh, but the main limitation is at the moment the diver. Mm -hmm. So divers typically can only dive up to 30 meters. I see. Um, but but most of the interesting you know surveys are done at, uh, at less than 20 meters, around maybe 15 meters. 
five to fifteen meters, so it's very very well within the the limit the limit for an open water diver. So uh, yeah, uh, okay. that is not really a serious limitation. Okay. That's good to know. So what are what's next? Like what's next for for fish eye? ROV version. Oh, okay, okay. Very interesting. Okay, so I. Okay, another one from Edsa. Okay, here's a crazy idea. Could you develop a robot fish that could swim with the other fish and gather data? There could be advantages to a data gathering system which is moving with the school of fish. What do you think? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a very interesting uh, um, yeah, proposal. Uh, actually, that that idea has been implemented, but not exactly the same idea, but fish, uh, a robot fish swimming uh, has been implemented in, I think, Spain, where the robot fish swam around to collect um, information about pollution uh, in an area. So what is the, um, you know, chemical profile of this, uh, this bay, for example. So there's a fish that's going around and measuring uh, the chemical content, you know, oxygen, the chemical, you know, you know all different parameters. Um, and these are geotag, so so it knows the coordinates uh, and of course the depth. Um, so yeah, uh, at the moment um, we don't have plans yet for for that, but it's a very interesting and a very good uh, proposal, I think. Yeah. Yeah, for, for that particular proposal, what do you think would be the challenges for developing um, yeah, this robotic uh, fish to gather data? Um, funding, I think. Is the, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, besides that, uh, I think we have enough, um, enough engineers and marine scientists who uh, can actually make uh, a fish robot. Uh, yeah. Um, so, okay, uh, you can also ask Elon Musk to find it. <laughs> Ed Cell suggested. <laughs> uh, he, might, he might be interested. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> Because uh, if you that will be an application of the technology that we're developing. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you can help us connect to. Uh, <laughs> Maybe Ed Cell can, can put in a word for you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, another follow-up question from Giselle. How about tagging fish to follow and understand life cycle and development? Oh, okay. Um, it's probably best answered by a marine scientist. Okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, tagging fish. So, okay, so if you tag fish, I think the best is to, yeah, I think it's possible, but for fish eye, well, fish eye is not adopted for that. Yeah, we have to develop a, another technology for, for maybe putting a tag on the fish and let it move from place to place. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, that's uh, is, uh, possible, um, but not at the moment for fish eye. It's interesting, also very interesting tagging. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Pros. A very interesting talk. Do you have any final words for our audience before we close the session? I think we've exhausted all of the questions. Uh, well, um, well, FishEye is uh, actually just uh, very new. It just uh, spun off um, just just last year, December last year. So uh, we thought that we could, uh, you know, start. Uh, going full blast uh, this year, but unfortunately, because of the current pandemic, we could not even um, uh, do surveys. We can, we're not allowed to visit the different sites. So, but, you know, um, once the pandemic is over, I think uh, we can go back. And uh, if you have, uh, if you want your sites uh, surveyed, then just uh, contact us uh, at this uh, email address. Um, and uh, thank you very much, also, Kay, you know, for you know for allowing me to 
talk about uh, fish eye and basically biodiversity using AI in this uh, webinar. Yeah, thank you also for ha having the time <laughs> to uh, lecture for Paase webinars. Um, okay, uh, before we close, I just want to promote our uh, next speaker. Okay, let me just share my screen. Okay. Okay, so next week, October 23, our speaker will be Professor Seville de Terra Wadley. So she was actually one of the recipients of the Severino Pasco um, Lectureship Award from Paase way back in 2017. So she will talk about induced pluripotent stem cells, disease and tissue modeling, gene editing, cell therapy, toxicology, and drug candidate screening. So if you're interested to join us next week, please don't forget to register at bit.ly SD Wadley. So again, it will be on Friday at 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, so you can find Paase at our website at paase.org and our recordings of the different webinars are uploaded in Paase Webinars YouTube channel, which is at bit.ly slash Paase Webinars. So I guess that's it for us today. Um, Pros, can you also send me a copy of your presentation so that if it's okay to share with uh, our audience? Okay. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. So thank you, everyone. Have a good day ahead. Good evening for those of you who are in the U.S. So hope to see you next week. Thank you, guys. Bye.